I was living in Nashville, Tennessee. I was married to Allison. That's not true. I was almost married to Allison. And I remember uh, my mom calling me and saying, we took your dad to the hospital and he was having some complications and they have transferred him to Charlotte. That's kind of like saying you went to the hospital here in Branson and things were so difficult they couldn't handle it here. So they needed to send you to like the big city, let's say St. Louis or Kansas City or to a specialist somewhere that a smaller town may not have. And so my mom took my dad to the local hospital and they realized that he had greater issues than what they thought he had. They needed to send him to Charlotte and now he was in need of something called triple bypass surgery. Has anybody, do you, you know what I'm talking about? Triple bypass surgery on your heart. Has anybody had triple bypass surgery? Great. Does anybody know people that have had a bypass or a triple bypass or a double? I've even heard of quadruple bypass surgeries. And so my dad was going in to have this and need this surgery. And so my mom asked the doctor, because again, I was living in Nashville, can we wait for Joey, my dad, to have the surgery after my son Matthew gets here? And the doctor said, absolutely not. We got to do this right now. And so as I was doing everything I could to get to my mom and be with her during this time and be with my dad and encourage my dad, and I remember praying on the phone with my dad and and hoping, quite honestly, that things would go, go okay in this heart surgery. And I would see him when I got there. And I remember telling him, look, Dad, I'll be there. I can't wait to see you. Uh, I'm with you, and I'm praying for you, and I'm praying for Mom. And then I remember about 30 minutes later, it's about a six-hour drive from Nashville to Charlotte, I remember my mom calling me, and she was kind of freaking out. She was frantic, and she was all in pieces. Does that make sense to you guys? She was crying hysterically on the phone, and I thought, oh, my God, my dad. What happened to my dad? And she was so nervous and worried, and she was just all beside herself. And I remember saying to my mom, Mom, don't fear. The Prince of Peace is with you. Now, I know, and that may sound silly to some of you, and I didn't really fully understand everything that I was saying to my mom at that time. But I knew that, that, that God and his love for my mom and my dad wouldn't want my mom, listen, to be in pieces. He would want her to be at peace. I was doing everything I could to get there. My mom sat there feeling like she was all alone, not knowing what was going to happen to my dad. She was in pieces, but I knew God would want her to be at peace. God doesn't want his people living in chaos, confused, overwhelmed. He wants his people living in peace. And so the title of today's message is this. In your notes right here, it says, at peace. I changed it to a peaceful dwelling because there's a difference in being at peace and staying in peace. Okay? A peaceful dwelling. The theme of today's message, and again, this is, falls in line with some, the way I've been introducing each of these words and these themes over the course of December in this series, but it's this. Biblical peace isn't an absence of our struggles, but is the presence of our Savior. Biblical peace isn't an absence of our struggles. We could even say problems but is the presence of our Savior. Just because our nation isn't at war physically doesn't mean we're at peace spiritually. Just because I'm not currently facing difficulties doesn't mean I'm okay. I, I've met a lot of people over the years that seem to be doing really, really well in life. They seem to be really, really good, and yet they aren't at peace. And that has been especially true in this season within 2020. I've met a lot of people their business never really got hurt. They ne it's, everything seemed to be going absolutely great for them. And yet, as I got to know them and as I was talking to them about all that was going on, just something wasn't settled in their heart. They weren't at peace. I want you to know it is possible to have a settled spirit in an unsettled world. And so what we're going to talk about today is in the midst of everything that has taken place in 2020, in the in the 
forefront of 2021, not knowing what's really going to happen. Can we stay at peace even when things around us may be falling apart? God's Word says we can. He shows us specifically how, and and we're going to talk about that today. Before we do, though, let me go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we love you. I'm just so thankful for your presence. Because truly, Lord, it is your presence that gives us peace. It's not the absence of struggles. It's not the absence of problems. It's literally your presence. And so, God, I thank you that even this morning, as, as a church, as we've dealt with the struggles and some problems of getting the baptistry filled and some lighting and text. Listen, your presence is here, Lord. And so not only can we be at peace, but Lord, we can experience life change. And so God, I thank you for that truth, that truth that sets us free so we can go live the life that you've called us to live. So God, have your way. Holy Spirit, move in this time. In Jesus' name. Amen. I, I want to start this morning by rereading Luke chapter 2 for us. We've been looking at it the last couple of weeks, but I want to reread Luke chapter 2, which is the birth story of Jesus. And then we're going to dissect a small section of that. It's actually going to be verse 14. We're going to read Luke 2, 1 through 15. We're going to dissect verse 14 in just a few moments. But I want us to continue to see the goodness of God shown in the giving of his son. But I also want us to see how we can have peace. When our world is in pieces. Uh, Just to remind you before we look at uh, Luke chapter 2. Luke wrote this to Theophilus to ensure that he understood why Jesus came. And ultimately what the presence of Jesus meant. Because uh, Luke realized and Luke knew that Theophilus would come and face a day. When things weren't always going to be easy to remain and be a believer in Jesus, a disciple of Christ. Luke realized and knew there would be a day that Theophilus would be confident in his faith, but the people around him would question his faith. And as a result, it may stir up in Theophilus some questions of his own. And so again, Luke is writing because he wants Theophilus to know just who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ means for disciples of his. And so he begins from the very beginning to indicate, we've already talked about all this, to indicate that Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. But not only is he the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, he is God's gift to Theophilus and to those who believe in Jesus today. And so here's what we see Luke writing, as he's again, he's writing about the birth of Jesus. And this is what we read. In those days, this is verse 1 of chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary. He was pledged to be married to Joseph, him, and was expecting a child. Verse 6, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Are you guys with me? We just finished verse Seven. I want to stop for just a minute to, to, to really kind of make sure that we understand the story that's taking place. This is a real story. I know we just celebrated Christmas. I know that if we're not careful, we can let all the fun of watching uh, incredible Christmas movies. We've talked and watched many of them uh, as sermon bumpers before I get up. We've watched part of Die Hard, and we know that's all of your favorite Christmas movie. We've seen now a little bit of Home Alone. We've watched other little Christmas movies. We, it, it's easy to, to, to lose focus in the holiday season, in the Christmas season. And so again, I just want to point this out. This is a real story. Jesus came. Christmas is about looking to and celebrating the fact that Jesus has come. It's a real story that happened, listen to this, on a real day in history. Not in some mythological, imaginary, it's not some mythological, imaginary story that, that, that happened and, you know, and it was in the town of Rivendell, right? It's not some mythological story that happened 
in, in uh, Hogsmeade Village. It's just, that's Harry Potter. It's not some mythological story that happened in the kingdom of far, far away. That's Shrek for any of you that have kids. Listen, this is a real story that happened on a real day in history in a real city, Bethlehem. Listen to this. On, on a day when Caesar Augustus was the emperor of Rome and Quirinius was governor of Syria. Are you following with me? A real day in, in history. Not in a fake town, but in a real town. And again, we celebrated Christmas a couple days ago. And at my house, we, we gathered around the Christmas tree and we enjoyed opening up all the fun toys that we were able to share. But the reason for Christmas goes back to a real story that happened thousands of years ago. You have to know the story of Jesus is real. The plan of God came to pass. God made good on his word. He sent Jesus, his son, to save the people. Not just a few people, but all people who will make Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior. John 3, 16, you guys know it. It was probably even one of the first verses you ever memorized. It it, it says this, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that's Jesus, to, listen to this, that whoever, that means anybody and anyone, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God's plan of redemption and salvation isn't just for a couple of people, but is for anyone that trusts Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And that's very real. Very real. The story continues in verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. This is Bill Ingvall's Here is Your Sign. Anybody watch that? I'm glad I got a laugh out of some of y'all. This will be your sign. Here's your sign. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel. I I was reading this this week, and and really the Lord began to show me some things a little bit different than I've ever seen them before in the story. And this is what I wrote down because I thought it was just so interesting and so good. It may be good enough for one angel to bring the good news of the gospel, but the good news of the gospel is so good, it summons and demands all of the heavenly host of the angels to respond. It may be good enough for one angel to tell about, tell about it, but it's, it's so good, it's so great. It summons and demands all the angels to respond. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, the writer of Hebrews is talking about Jesus being above the angels in rank and order. And to make his point, he goes back to the Old Testament and he, and he reminds us that when God brings his firstborn into the world, all God's angels would worship him. And so when the shepherds are out in the field and the angel comes and says, I'm, I've got great news, and, and we begin to hear the response and what the angels are saying. How many angels showed up? I've heard people say a thousand, a couple thousand, but this is what we read. How many angels showed up to declare to the shepherds? Revelation chapter 5 verse 11 says that that. John is writing, and he's talking about being able to see a glimpse of heaven, just a, a, a section of heaven and with all of the angels, just in that one section. He says this about how many angels. He said, he looked and he heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. Now, I'm not a great mathematician, but I did a little math for you. And 10,000 times 10,000 is 100 million. And so when we're looking at this story and we're beginning to unfold it and we see that suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angels declaring the good news that Jesus Christ had been born. It wasn't just a couple angels. It was millions and millions and millions of angels that filled the sky. I want to be clear because I just think it's so incredible. It took one angel to tell the good news of Jesus, but that good news was so good, it demanded millions of angels to respond, which begs the question for us, have you responded to the gospel? 
It only takes one person to tell the gospel. But everybody, all people, will have to respond. And we will either accept it or reject it. And you may be wondering, well, did I accept it or did I reject it? Well, is Jesus Christ Lord of your life or not? If he's not Lord, then he's not Savior. And we see in God's Word that not only did all the angels respond, but there is a response that is always demanded. The, the, the response of the angels, I thought this was great. It, it, it was praising God, and this is what they said. Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. This was the response that the angels had from the declaration that Jesus Christ was born. Listen to what they said again. Glory to God in the highest heaven. A mil- hundred millions of angels. Glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now this week I, I've thought a lot about why this was what the angels said to the shepherds. I mean out of everything that the angels could have said. They thought that the best thing they could say to the world in that moment. And to these shepherd guys was glory to God and peace has come to those on whom his favor rests. And here's why I believe this was the best news for those shepherds then and is really the best news and the best thing of way to respond to us now. And I was thinking about the day of the shepherds. I was thinking about our day right now and what we're experiencing and what we've experienced in 2020. I was thinking about what we may experience or not experience in 2021. I mean, nobody knows what 2021 is actually going to look like or be like. But I was thinking about what do we need to hear? What do we need to hear? What did the shepherds need to hear? Well, they needed to hear glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And here, here, here's what basically and reason I believe this was so key. The world will always have problems. Justice on earth won't always be found. Things won't always be fair. Life will sometimes be hard. Marriages will sometimes not work out. Homes will sometimes be chaotic. Our decisions will sometimes cause more hurt than good. We, we may think that life is hard now, but I want you to understand these were also the realities of life for these shepherd boys, these shepherd guys. Life was hard. Then. They weren't immune to the difficulties of the world. In that day, I just want you to know, they were under the rule of a political narcissist. And listen, ungodly, unbiblical principles and values were being taught and lived out. They were under the rule of a terrible leader. And, and the things that the world and everybody was focusing on was unbiblical and ungodly. And to these, and to that environment, Angels came to the shepherds and said, glory to God. Now, do you think that sounds glorious? Glory to God. Peace on on all who his favor rest. And I believe that the reason, and I've mentioned it already, but the reason the angels brought this word and this was their response is because we needed to know, the shepherds needed to know that we can be at peace even when our world seems to be in pieces. And what the angel said in particular is also the indicator of how peace is possible. Let me remind you. The angel said, glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. What we see here is that the greatest revelation of the glory of God is the manifestation of the Son of God, which is Jesus. Did you hear what I said? The greatest revelation of the glory of God is the manifestation of the Son of God, which is Jesus. In other words, and here it is, peace is found in the glory of God manifested in the presence of Jesus. That's what the angels are wanting us to see. That's what the angels needed the shepherds to know. It's because everything around the shepherds wasn't so peaceful. It wasn't so great. But peace could still be found, even though God's offer of peace 
is for all, listen, only the people who believe in Jesus and trust him as Savior and Lord will experience the peace he brings. In John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus says this, my peace I give you. Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 2, 14, Jesus is our peace. What this means is that the peace of God or the peace that Jesus gives can never be separated from Jesus. I wrote this down. It's going to be in your notes. If we want peace to be in our lives, then Jesus must rule over our lives. In other words, you can't have the peace of Jesus apart from his presence. You can't have it. So therefore, listen, to dwell in peace is to dwell in Jesus. I think it's interesting, over 75 times in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, who wrote the bulk of the New Testament, writes to Christians and disciples to be found in Christ. Why? Because they were being martyred and persecuted. Things in their world was absolutely jacked up and crazy. And, the, and Paul wanted and needed his disciples, his people, to know that, listen, they can still be at peace if they're found in Christ. On Christmas Eve, how many of you came to Christmas Eve? We had such a great time together. We read John 1 and his account of the birth of Jesus, and he writes this, and I think it's so great, and provides clarity to what I'm saying. He says this, in the beginning was the Lord. This is the, this is the birth of Jesus as told by the John the Gospel writer. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. He's talking about Jesus here, okay? We have seen, listen to this, we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. John shows us something here so transformational in this account of Jesus coming up. He says, not only is the glory of God seen in the manifestation of Jesus, but listen to this. But that Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. And here's what this shows us. If we want to have the peace of God, we must be found in the presence of Jesus. And the presence of Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? I'm going to say it again because I don't want you to miss this. If we want to have the peace of God, we must be found in the presence of Jesus. Right? Right? Peace is not the absence of struggles. It's the presence of our Savior, which is Jesus. Okay? If we want to have the peace of God, we must be found in the presence of Jesus. And the presence of Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. And so here's what this is showing us. To dwell in Jesus is to dwell in the Word. If you want to be found in Christ, then you need to be found in God's Word. If you want the peace of God, it does not come unless you are in Christ, or we could even say in his word. I, I, I mentioned this earlier. We have no idea what's going to happen in 2021. Uh, we don't even really know how 2020 is going to end when we got a couple more days left, you know what I'm saying? And uh, a lot of things can happen in an afternoon, in a few days. We don't know how it's all going to end, but I do believe this. I, I do believe that God doesn't want us to fear the future. And I, I definitely don't believe God wants us to go into it uh, confused and overwhelmed with what may happen or may not happen in January or February, March, April, May, or, or, or so, so forth. And so for us as a church, I want us to be able to live the way God intended at peace. And so here's what we're going to do. I gave you a little acronym there at the bottom. It's to stay at peace, we have to stay in the Word. And I want us in 2021 to stay in the Word together. And so this next week, I'm going to be sending out to us. I hope that, that you're a part of our email. If you're not, you can put your, your name and information on that information card and, so that we can have it. But I'm going to be sending you a Bible reading plan for 2021. I want all of us to be reading God's Word together. It is paramount for God's people to be in God's Word, okay? And I want us to do it together. I believe this. If being in God's Word brings, brings peace, 
then when we're all in God's word, it's going to bring more peace. <laughs> if the word of God is the presence of God, then as we're all in God's word, then we even get more of God's presence. And I want that for our church. I want us to be unified in our approach to God's word. I want us to be unified in how we read and how we understand the scripture. Some of you, I've mentioned this before, uh, and to some of you, when you say, well, you don't know how to read God's word, you don't know how to study God's word. And, and so what I wanted to do was give you a little acronym of how I study God's word. Every single day, I, I do my best. I don't always do it. I'm not gonna lie, stand up here and lie to you. But I, I do my best to be in God's word and to journal through it. I just found that that is the best way for me to see that God is still speaking to me even when sometimes I don't feel like he is. And so I wrote down this acronym. It's based on Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, which says that the word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword. And so the acronym that I use to, to read through and journal through scripture is called SWORD. And now all I do is when, I'm, when I have my sheet of paper or when I'm on my phone, I do it in my my notes section, I just write down S-W-O-R-D. And here's how this looks. And I, I wrote this down. I gave it to you. The S means for the scripture that you read that morning. So for instance, today, you could just write down, if you were going to journal through the scripture for today, Luke 2, 1 through 15. Does that make sense? That's what we read together. We're going to finish 15 here in just a few moments. That's what you read. The W is the specific word that God spoke to you about. We could say today, since we dissected Luke chapter 2, verse 14, that's where we would write there at the W, Luke 2, 14. And I would just write out the, the verse of Scripture that God gave. O is the observation of what's taking place in the text. We could call it the context of what's taking place around the Scripture. It is always key that we know what was taking place in God's Word then so we can understand how to apply it to God's world now. Okay? Because sometimes we, make, we try to act like God's saying one thing when he said something completely different. We just misunderstood it based on the context. So the O is really context. R is really application. It's your time to respond to God's word. What do you need to do now that you read this scripture? Maybe today, if you looked at Luke chapter 2, verse 14, you would say, I need to respond to Jesus and trust him as my Lord and Savior so that I can have the peace of God, which only comes in Christ. Maybe you could say, well, I have been praying and asking God to show up, and I clearly see that he showed up in the person of Jesus, and I need to focus my life a little more on Jesus. Maybe you could say, I just simply need to read God's word more often. Whatever your response is, the application, that's what you would write there in the R, and the D is just simply dialogue or prayer with God. I just write a simple prayer out and, and, and talk to God about what's going on. Here, again, this is my, my heart for us. If God's word is clear, there will be problems and there will be trouble in the world. We don't have to fear. God, Jesus, gives us his peace that is made available to us as we stay in him. And he is the word. And so if we're going to have the peace of God, we've got to stay in the Word of God. And so I want us to do that together in 2021. I think this is interesting. When we stay in God's Word, we will experience Jesus like never before and will therefore experience His peace like only He can give. The shepherds wanted the peace of God so badly because here's the reality. They were out there, all these angels came, and they all said, glory to God in the highest and peace to those on whom his favor rests. And they had an opportunity. They could, they could choose to do anything they wanted to do at that point. They could have dismissed what the angels said and did. Or they could respond favorably to it to go check out what God was doing. Well, the angels so desperately wanted peace in their life. This is what we read took place and how the scripture concludes in verse 15. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, this is how you know their country. Listen to how they, what they thought. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing. Come on, that's good. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Churches 2020 ends and 2021 begins. Let's not forget that as the world goes to pieces, 
the Lord still gives us the opportunity to stay at peace. I mean, can I be real? You know, as I think through this next year, there, I've got a lot of things go through my mind. How do I lead a church in 2021 when everything that we read and everything that we says things are going to be very, very different <laughs> from here on out? How do I do this and how do I do that? And I have the tendency to get overwhelmed. How do I care for my mom that's 14 hours away? How do I visit my grandpa who's 14, 15 hours away? How do I care for my family? And I'm nowhere near them. And man, I can let my mind take me to so many places. It's just so unhealthy. And I can lay down at night, not sleep in a wink, just because I can't settle my mind. But church family, I want you to know, the Lord says, the Lord has showed us that whatever comes our way as unsettling as our situations and circumstances and world may seem, we could be settled in our heart. We can find peace even when our world is in pieces because biblical peace isn't the absence of struggles. It's the presence of our Savior. And I want to give you the opportunity this morning to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Savior, that is made available to you so you can experience the peace that only He gives. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you, Lord, for your your presence. (laughs) Lord, we gather to end our year together in you because, Lord, I believe that we all knew in this place that, Lord, without you, we can do nothing. With you, we can do everything. And that, Lord, we can't even begin to think about overcoming if we're not found in you. And so, Lord, we have chosen, we have settled it in our heart that we're going to end our year in you. And so, Lord, I thank you that you have told us that as we have settled that, your presence is with us. And so is your peace. In church, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to say this to you. You cannot have the peace of Jesus Christ if He is not your Lord and Savior. And I don't want you to end this year without giving you the opportunity to experience the peace that only Jesus gives. And so at the count of three, I want you to raise your hand if today's the day that you want to give your life to Jesus Christ and experience the peace that only He can give. One, two, three. Three, if today's the day that you want to receive the the peace of Jesus by making him Lord and Savior of your life, raise your hand. I see you, sir. Thank you. One, whether you've settled it in your heart, whether you're settling it now, salvation is, is not the raising of a hand. It's not even the saying of a prayer. It is the position and posture of our heart toward the Lord. And I'm going to ask you, for those of you that raised your hand, just about to repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. I need you in my life. Thank you for the peace that is made available in you. I give you my life. I end it in you. I'll begin it in you. And 2021 starts. In Jesus' name, amen. Church family, it is so good to be in the house of the Lord. For those of you that responded to the gospel today, maybe you've responded recently, and you know, I want to end 2021 being obedient to Christ. I'm going to give you the opportunity today to take your next step in baptism. We have t-shirts available for you. We've even got a few uh, towels in the back. If today's the day that you want to take that next step, Be baptized in the name of Jesus. Show your world of the decision you've made. Don't let today go by without you being faithful and obedient to God. As you stand and as we sing, if you're ready to make that next statement and that next step, why don't you meet me over here on the side and in just in a few minutes, we will baptize those that are ready to take that step.